million confirmed cases nationwide. But overseas, the Taj Mahal is finally reopening to visitors after being closed for six months due to the pandemic. And fire officials now say a wildfire near Los Angeles has burned more than 103,000 acres, making it one of the largest in L.A. County history. The Bobcat fire has even threatened the famous Mount Wilson Observatory. Strong winds late last week caused that fire to nearly double in size, at one point creating a tornado of smoke. And another day of high winds in the West is not helping firefighters there. Meanwhile, along parts of the Gulf Coast, Tropical Storm Beta is now taking aim at Texas. Our Matt Gutman is in Galveston, where waves are already picking up and bringing in dangerous storm surge. Matt, good morning. Hey, Diane, good morning. So I'm on the seawall here in Galveston, and this was built to try to stop the Gulf of Mexico from engulfing the city of Galveston, uh, which has happened in the past. But you can see there, there is wind, there's not a lot of rain right now, and that's because Beta is pretty much a, a dying storm, still a dangerous one. I want to show you something that's pretty crazy. I'm going to go down these stairs. Uh, so this is the seawall. Now, the shoreline is normally about 50 yards in that direction, but you can see what kind of whoop, storm surge there is. I didn't want to get completely wet just now. Um, you know, powerful enough and strong enough to really gobble up a tremendous amount of beach line here. There's going to be significant erosion. We are already seeing uh, roads, homes that have been uh, submerged in water. And of course, the biggest concern from Beta is that it's taking the same track pretty much as Hurricane Harvey, sort of grinding it up the Texas coast, then moving on to Houston a little bit inland. And it's going to park itself pretty much over the fourth biggest city in the country for at least a couple of days. That means up to 10 inches, maybe more of rain. And we've all seen how easily Houston floods. Uh, so that is the major concern right now. Huge population center, a pretty significant amount of rain uh, in a short period of time. Um, so the next couple of days, everybody's a little bit on tenter hooks here. Diane. Understandable. Matt Gutman, Forrest in Galveston, Texas. Go get dry, Matt. And from legal icon to cultural icon, Ruth Bader Ginsburg stood barely five feet tall, but her impact on this country was giant. So how did she become the notorious RBG? Here's Deborah Roberts with more on the life and legacy of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. The world remembers her as a brilliant legal super force, but in the latter part of her career, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg also became a cultural icon. Her fight for equality getting the full Hollywood treatment in the movie on the basis of sex. So they're going to give you a corner office? I wasn't what they were looking for. One said women are too emotional to be lawyers. Diminutive, but with a giant intellect, Ginsburg was hailed for her legal prowess and sharp dissents, so much so that she was affectionately dubbed the notorious RBG. Lawyer and author Shauna Kanainik, giving Justice Ginsburg that fierce-sounding nickname on a blog as a law student seven years ago, comparing her to late rapper Notorious B.I.G. They were both born and bred in Brooklyn, New York, and they both used their words to speak truth to power. The bespectacled justice with the whimsical colors also becoming a popular meme, leading some to call her the meme supreme. You could kind of see the gleam in her eye as she took in the love of the crowd. And the octogenarian's image finding its way onto T-shirts, mugs, even tattoos. Ginsburg's cultural impact sealed with Saturday Night Live paying homage to the legendary justice in this video. <laughs> like a butterfly, I sting like a bee, I clean myself like a fly. <laughs> In the Oscar-nominated documentary, RBG, Ginsburg reacting to that clip. She was able to laugh mm -hmm. at Kate McKinnon's impersonation of her, which of course is just completely over the top, and yet there was a real truth behind that impersonation, and it, and it uh, gave her a kick. But her biggest impact of all may be on the next generation. This weekend, social media flooded with parents sharing pictures of their daughters dressed up as the justice, all honoring their role model. Our thanks to Deborah Roberts for that report. And for more, we're joined by a former clerk to Justice Ginsburg, now a law professor at Fordham University, Aaron Sager. Aaron, I know the country is mourning this loss today, but I know for you it's a bit more personal. So first, I just want to say I'm sorry to you and ask how you're doing. Thanks so much. It is a um, devastating loss for everyone who knew her, but also for everyone in the country. And so um, 
I feel that we are all in this together in an important way. What was it like for you to work so closely with Justice Ginsburg? Um, it was, first of all, a uh, professional dream. I've never had a boss who was uh, from whom I learned more or who was more careful, more demanding, more fair, and more inspiring than the justice. She really um, affected, I think, all of her clerks in a very personal way as we, because um, we were young and we were starting to build our careers and our families. And so she was an inspiration in that way. And she was a little scary too. I mean, she was a very demanding boss and um, I always was worried that I would make a mistake uh, because we all wanted, because uh, she never made mistakes as far as we could tell. And we all wanted to um, keep her uh, satisfied with the work that we were doing. Yeah, I'm sure you wanted to impress her as well. You know, part of part of that, I'm sure, was that she had once been in your shoes. And, and we all talk about the notorious RBG and the legacy that, that she built, but she didn't start there. And I know she hit a lot of obstacles along the way. So talk a little bit about her path and how she overcame those. Yes, some of those, many of those were professional. The legal profession when Justice Ginsburg went to law school, first at Harvard and then at Columbia, it, we, you often hear that it discriminated against women, but really it was almost contemptuous of uh, women's efforts to join the profession. There were almost no women and there's a whole pile of famous stories about um, the kind of obstacles that uh, the justice faced very early in her career. Notably, she couldn't get the job that she gave to me, despite the um, very strong efforts of the faculty at Columbia Law School, because none of the justices were willing to take on a woman as a clerk. Um, and then she had trouble finding employment after the district court court clerkship that she did do, and um, had a great deal of difficulty finding uh, her first job in the profession. But she did eventually break through. What is it about the way she approached the law that you think helped her accomplish that? I would list two things. One is that um, she was an, she, her understanding of the purpose of the law was founded on a real empathy for people's individual circumstances. If you go back over what she wrote as a judge and then a justice, and the way that she litigated her cases when she was um, arguing before the courts, you find over and over again efforts to um, convey to her audiences what it's like to be a person in the situation where her um, clients found, the situations in which their cli her clients found themselves. And I think that was an extremely because it was so heartfelt and genuine, I think it reached people in a way that the more abstract arguments, which of course she could do, and which lawyers liked to think is the um, basis of everything that we do, but she was able to reach people who otherwise might not have been uh, reached. And the second thing is that she was the most tenacious person I ever met. She really was never uh, willing to give up on anything, and she worked like a demon. And so um, she worked enormously hard, and she had enormous energy, and she um, did not take no for an answer. And setbacks were always uh, bumps in the road on the way to where she wanted to go. And that was um, an attitude that characterized her entire career, both before she joined the bench and afterwards. Well, you know, she made it to the highest court in the land, so her legal acumen speaks for herself. But she also, in her later years, became a cultural icon. You know, we were just showing a little while ago the video of Kate McKinnon imitating her on SNL. You know, that's not something you often see with a Supreme Court justice. What do you think it was about her that, that sent her to this level? It's true that her story was inspirational and... Um really quite remarkable in what she managed to overcome. One of the um, ways in which uh, that I didn't mention about obstacles were not professional, right? Her husband, Marty, had cancer as a law student. She survived that as a very young person and helped him get through law school as, as she was doing it herself. Um, she had her own battles with illness, of course, on the court. Um, and her absolute dedication to her causes was known to everyone. But also, she really believed in um, educating the world about what her vision of equality 
looked like. And she took that educational mission very seriously. I was at a student uh, meeting with her once, seventh and eighth graders, and um, someone asked her what had changed the most about the relationship between men and women since she had been uh, in the profession. And I was very surprised because her answer had nothing to do with the law. It was about housework. And she said, men do housework now. And that's an enormous change. And it's a change we're still working on. But it's a change that can't be underestimated. And I think she wanted people to, women and girls in particular, to know that they were not restricted by uh, the conventions of the culture they found themselves in. And they could do what they wanted to do, and they could expect to be treated equally by the people around them by quietly insisting upon it always. And I think that the prospect of being able to bring that message to as many people as possible galvanized her in the later years of her career. It sure did. Uh, Aaron, I can't think of a better note to leave on than your favorite memories. I know you spent a good amount of time with her. What sticks out to you? What do you look back on? It's actually a memory about the point I just made. Um, I saw a bunch of student groups with her when I worked for her. And so when my daughter's Manhattan school decided to take a trip to the Supreme Court 10 years later, I asked her if she would meet with the seventh graders, and she uh, readily agreed. We arrived in the bus that morning, and only then did I learn that her husband, Martin Ginsburg, uh, was really uh, a few days away from death. And I hadn't known, I hadn't been in touch with her in the past few weeks, I hadn't known that the end was coming. And so I said to the office, you know, we totally understand. I'll explain it to the children. And they said, oh, no, the justice has arranged for Justice Breyer to meet with the children because she couldn't even consume with her own problems. And Marty, of course, was the absolute love of her life. She wanted to make sure that these children did not miss their experience of the Supreme Court. And then the office said, and she may come. And indeed, we arrived in the court and I had, um, we'd assembled the children and she swooped in. And uh, because she, um, had this attitude that work always had to be done. She delivered what was an absolutely memorable hour with a bunch of seventh graders. And then we went back to her office and she told me how sick Marty was. And I just was overwhelmed both by the personal consideration she had showed to me and my family, but more by her simultaneous devotion to her own family and to the children of America, right, whom she really was very dedicated to. She managed to spread it all the way around. Aaron Sager, law professor at Fordham University and former clerk to Justice Ginsburg, we appreciate your time. And again, Aaron, I'm so sorry for your loss. Thank you so very much. Let's go over to Hollywood now, where the virtual red carpet was rolled out last night for the 72nd annual Emmy Awards. It was a show like none of us have ever seen. Jimmy Kimmel hosted in a nearly empty Staples Center and stars appeared virtually in more than 100 different locations. ABC's Will Reeve even spoke to some of the winners from a virtual backstage. For nearly the entire first hour, that fun-loving Rose family from that show about a creek was all America saw. On fire. Sweeping the comedy category with seven consecutive Emmys. For now, it just feels really f good. So <laughs> I don't think I can say that on Good Morning America, no. but I just you did. You, it's you true. Can't, you can't say that. We also can't you, say the name of your show on Good Morning America. Let's start to change that. After seven Emmys, can we just say, let's just allow morning television to say the word. For the cast and crew watching from a tent in Canada, it truly was a family affair. As a dad getting to work on camera for six years with both my kids, Daniel and and Sarah, hi, honey. Eugene, you last won an Emmy the year that your son was born, and now you're winning Emmys together. What does that feel like? Seven years ago, my son came up and said, do you want to work on a show? Here we are. We used to refer to it up until very recently as the little engine that could. <laughs> and uh, I guess we finally pulled into a big station. What is your favorite season? Awards. It's strange that this sad uh, virus has forced people to stay home and discover some shows that they never watched. <laughs> and that we actually seem to be some kind of marker for, for how a family might survive being holed up in a couple of rooms together. I'm honestly sincerely grateful. Annie, you were about to quit the business. What does it feel like right now? I'm sure glad I didn't quit the business. <laughs> <laughs> Zendaya, euphoria. <laughs> 
Another star making their way in a family affair, Zendaya, the youngest ever to take home lead actress in a drama series. So what does that all feel like to you? What's going through your mind? I was very nervous. <laughs> um, but I think definitely having my family here and, and just kind of feeling that blanket of love that was kind of surrounding me really brought me a lot of comfort. Cozy at home or on stage, the stars still showed up looking fierce. But wow. one of the sweetest moments of the night wow. came from Uzo Aduba wow. after her Best Supporting okay. Actress win for Mrs. Wow. America. Mom, I won! Oh, my gosh. And Mom was even there during our interview. My mom is calling me P.S. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what's... So what, you know. Mom comes first. What is... That is something that does not happen. At yeah. What does Mom need? <laughs> I don't know what you're calling me. Just a second. I'm doing an interview. Does she want to come join? Tell her to come hang out. No, she does not. She does not want to come on. No. Hello to your mother. Congratulations to you. And congratulations to your mother. <laughs> Good night, Rizzo. I'll Thanks. be back, y'all. Coming, Mom. Some great moments. I kind of like virtual backstage even better than real backstage. Um, but another highlight of the night, Tyler Perry was honored with the Governor's Award celebrating his achievements in the media industry. And on an interesting note, all of the big winners came from traditional broadcast television rather than streaming services. Our thanks to Will Reeve for those cute moments backstage. On a more serious note, President Trump has approved a deal to sell TikTok. ABC's Kenneth Moten has that story and more from the world of science and technology. In today's Tech Bites, President Trump has given his blessing to a tentative deal to keep TikTok afloat in the U.S. The proposal calls for the app to partner with Oracle and Walmart to form a U.S. company, and it averts a ban on TikTok downloads. The agreement was born out of concern over data privacy. Amazon is set to debut new products this week. Reports say customers may see more Alexa upgrades. The only thing Amazon will say about Thursday's event is the company will, quote, share some news. Finally, convenience stores in Japan are using seven-foot robots to stock shelves. The robot called Model T is controlled by a pilot wearing a virtual reality headset and special gloves. They allow the pilot to feel the product that the robot is putting on the shelf. Those are your tech bites. Diane, true story, my first real job was at a grocery store, stocking the shelves, and I didn't need no robot. Back to you. <laughs> there you go, Kenneth. Show them how it's done. Kenneth Moten for us. Thank you. And that does it for this ABC News Live update. I'm Diane Macedo. Thank you for joining us. And remember, ABC News Live is here for you all day with the latest news, context, and analysis. Up next, GMA's top stories. Have a great day. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.